I'm excited to introduce our next uh, keynote conversation, which is with Tom Stockham. Um, he's the CEO of a company. I also like to think of Tom as being involved in many companies in executive roles, which is why I think his perspective is so interesting. So Tom, thanks for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. <coughs> I'm making my chair taller. I have we to make get my to chair look taller. at that horrible picture the whole time right up here. Sorry. <laughs> We're all going through the same torture. <laughs> I think it's all good. Uh -huh. <laughs> Just for done, it's the video camera that's projecting you right yep. up there. Um, so thank you for um, joining us. You know, Tom, a, a year ago when I asked you to be part of the CEO Roundtable, and you kind of just jumped right in, I really appreciated that because you've been from the very first really reflective on these issues and really thoughtful around what we can do and where we're headed. And I think you have this unique perspective of having built many companies not only out of the state but in the state and over you know, the last few decades and thinking about how things have changed. Right? And, I, and actually, that's one of my questions for you, which is, as you think about what it meant to recruit talent you know, a decade ago or even two decades ago to today, what has changed when, as, as it pertains to creating um, inclusive cultures? Boy, so um, uh, I, and I think I've uh, uh, gotten a little bit better at listening more closely to the people who tell you no. And, um, you know, in, uh, two decades ago, trying to build a company in Utah, om it was overwhelmingly difficult to get anyone outside of the state to say, yes, I'll move to Utah and change my career and come be part of leadership of a company there. That's evolved a lot, a lot. We, as a state, we have a much better uh, ability to attract and retain people who two decades ago would never have thought of coming to Utah, and now they will. Um, and yet, we still have a gigantic problem of people feeling like they have a notion of what Utah is and they don't fit in. Whether it's a culture around women or culture around other um, uh, uh, religious, cultural, ethnic diversity, there's a stereotype about Utah and a reality about Utah that we just still have a long way to go before we overcome. So related to that, what have you changed and what are you doing to help overcome some of those as you're building your company now? So um, all I ever really care about is, and I focus way more on the most executive talent. Who's That's going right. to be the leadership of the company in its next phase. So I focus on hiring, recruiting, getting excited, the people who, whose ambition is what they see the company being in its next mm -hmm. phase. And um, with those people, uh, what's important to them? What, what do they do? I, uh, some of the things that are practical and different are, some are quite small, like leave policies or things like that. And, I think if you listen out in the world, whether it's in Silicon Valley or other places, you can just, you can get inspired by companies that are doing cool, interesting, innovative things. Um, but more than that, it is, um, again, listening to the people who tell you, you know, right this minute, I think culturally we're going through this interesting thing where it's more accepted, super clearly accepted for executives or for any rising star to have had a pause in their career. Um, you know, how, uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna just take the analogy in a, in a different direction. So my, one of my closest friends I just spent the weekend with, the roommate in business school, Greg Schott, just took MuleSoft public, started running it eight years ago. A million dollars in revenue, trailing 12 months just now was 188 million or something. I, IPO at $4 billion. He took five years off in the middle of his career to go be a dad and spend some time not in a super frenetic uh, environment. I think Josh took a year or two off between um, Omniture and, and uh, Domo. He took many mo several months off anyway. I took five years off. I, and anyway, those are all male examples, but I think with women, um, also, I, there's just been this, Linda Wells in Park City tried to put together a thing where she was literally helping 
people repackage themselves mm -hmm. in, on reentering the workforce. So I think, again, among executives and senior leaders, there's a, a trend that I'm trying to figure out how to embrace and tap into. Right. How do you find someone who may have paused during their career um, but is ready to get back at it and help them understand we're looking for the best leadership of what this company will be in its next months and years? How do you bring those people in? So you're, you're triggering for me a conversation we've had in the CEO roundtables over the last year, which is around, um, and it, this was not in your notes, just so you know, but which is around that conversation of how do we build networks of people and yeah. access to them, right? So one of the topics in the CEO roundtable that we often talk about with, especially because the CEO roundtable is 90% men, um, is we, we actually ask the questions and talk about how much of your network are women? Right? Like how many women do you actually know? Because we all know that the next jobs we find are by our network. Right? Every position I've ever had has been granted to me because of someone that I know. So when we look at those people driving cultures, right, what are we doing to create more diverse networks? Because you naturally go to referrals yeah. of people you know. Yeah. And so we've been talking about this over the last year. I don't think we've solved this problem yet. No. But you know, what are your thoughts on that, on what we can do better to build networks that include both you know, even both genders. Because I think naturally the networks of most senior men don't include significant numbers of women. And uh, the, that's absolutely right, and it is something to solve. My first comment <laughs> when I sat down on the council was, wait, what are the networking events where outstanding women are, are saying, hey, here are my aspirations, here's what I'd like to do, and here's my background and why I could be valuable doing that. And it's not clear to me. A, a, a slightly different thing, I get two to three calls a week from someone and 90 plus percent of the time it's a male saying, hey, I'm thinking about switching careers, I am uh, maybe thinking about moving to Utah, uh, people have mentioned you, can you, could we get together for lunch and could you give me advice? And most of the time I love that, I, I, someone takes me to lunch or for a cup of coffee and... Uh, <laughs> oh, and, I see how and, it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it turns out most of the time I wind up paying. But, um, uh, but it's this thing where you notice that it's, it's not that 90% of the people who are thinking that way are male, and yet more than 90% of the calls are from males. Stop, change that, you know. Now uh, they're all calling you. Yeah, well, okay, great. <laughs> no, that, that's, lunches for a year. <laughs> that, that is great. I, I want to, anyone wants to work with people who kick your butt by inspiring you. They, they show you what's possible. They make you think, wow, I want to be more like that when I grow up. Yeah. And uh, you, got, you have to find those people to, to make that possible. And networking is something that, really need, there needs to be more of that. I feel like that's actually one of our objectives for the year is to figure out how to help solve this. We've talked a lot about it a lot with the CEO Roundtable. I think we have some ideas, but I actually, it's a collective issue to, to solve. And, and I think it actually does create economic impact if we can figure out yeah. some of those um, key things. So as you, you know, as our, as our time is coming to an end here, I'm really curious, having built many companies, mm -hmm. what is your one piece of advice that you give people on creating cultures that really support inclusion? Boy, I don't know whether it's advice or, it, it is. I, focus on the goals, focus on the goals. No one that I know of wants to work in a place where you rise to the top by uh, uh, something that isn't a goal. Like who sat in the seat for the longest time that week? Who, showed up and had more face time, who scheduled more meetings. Those are not the cultures you want to build or believe in. Yep. If you say, who can, who can achieve the following thing by 90 days from now, that is inclusive. And there are lots of people who can be really creative about how and where and when to get that goal done by what period of time. That's right, it's really the culture of accountability, right? Like we're headed in the same direction and yeah. passionately achieve and that. And you don't have to be here on Thursday at 7.45 a.m. showing FaceTime just for the, fa fa the you know, whatever cosmetics of it, the optics of it. It's like, let's get this done. 
figure out how to get it done. That's right. So I really appreciate that because that is something I passionately believe in. Hold me accountable for whatever I'm supposed to do and just let me get it done you know, with the team as necessary, but in give me the flexibility. creative way. Exactly. Yeah. Hey, well, Tom, thank you. Thank you for being a partner with us over the last year on that, because I think it makes a difference to have you represented there. Fun for so me. join me in thanking Tom. Thank